Hi, today we're reading chapter six of Bubble. Um, the last we saw Joe, he was getting closer with his nurse, Amir, um, and he was talking about how excited about his documentary um, to get recorded on TV, and we haven't gotten an update on Henry and he forgot to go outside yet, so maybe we'll figure that out during this chapter. So, chapter six. 11 years, two months, and 25 days. My eyes are blurry and my head is aching when I wake up the next morning. The sound of the drills is getting closer, but I don't think it's that. It feels like someone has taken the top of my head and poured hot porridge inside. Sarah has been beeping on my laptop, but I don't feel like learning about sounds and waves today, especially when I know the TV people are outside. I can hear the sound of laughter and I recognize Graham's voice as he gets changed in the transition zone. He's the one that makes the documentary. He made the first one when I was two and we've done another nine cents. I can't wait to see him, not because I get to be on TV, but because for once something different gets to happen in my day. I go to the bathroom and splash cold water on my face. I still feel dizzy. I shake my head and try to clear the porridge, but it doesn't work. On the other side of the door, the voices are quieter. I stop by the door. Charlotte R. is talking. I don't know, she says. I'm not sure. I was told you had to reschedule. I hear the sound of running water and squirt the disinfectant. I press my ear against the door. Reschedule, says Graham. No, we've not heard anything about that. It's our last day. We just want to spend it with Joe. But, Dr. Moore said, did you want to check that then? The door to the correspondent clicks open. I hear footsteps. The door closes. Graham and someone I didn't recognize talk in a transition zone. Spray everything, says Graham. Camera, tripod, microphone. Everything? I hear the sound of the metal scraping the floor. The hiss of the antibacterial fluid being sprayed. What is she talking about postponing? The whole point is that these programs are about life and death. I know. I guess she's just not doing her job. David, they should know it's not all about the survival and recovery. We can't stop filming just because somebody dies. They stop talking. Die? They can't mean me, can they? Am I about to die? It's so hard to tell sometimes. My whites are back up. I might have a headache and I know that I feel dizzy, but I'm feeling better than I did three days ago. And I haven't had a nosebleed since then. No, I don't think it's me. It could be anyone because the kids die here all the time. They might mean the boy with the billard bar ball head, but I know thought that he was getting better. Maybe it's the girl who chases him, pretending to be a horse. Or it could be the boy who reads the Hunger Games all day. It could be any of them, and I feel bad for whoever it is. The corridor clicks open. Sorry, Charlotte R. says. He's not answering his pager. How, are we, how about we get started and see how it goes? Okay, but I'll sit in. Then if it gets to be too much, we stop, of course. Okay. All set, David. I walk back to my bed. My door slides open. Charlotte R. R walks in, followed by a young guy wearing white overalls. He's got a camera in one hand and a silver box hangs from the other. He nods at me, puts the box gently on the ground, and then looks slowly around the room like he's landed on Mars. Charlotte R. walks over to me. I've told them I'll sit in for a while, okay? I smile. But you tell me as soon as it gets to be too much. It won't, I say. Charlotte R. shakes her head. I know you want to do this, but you just need to tell me if you feel bad. I will. I won't. She walks toward the bathroom and sits down in the chair outside it. I hear a knock, and then Graham walks in with a tripod in his hand and a big smile on his face. Hey, there he is. How are you doing, young man? I smile and feel warm inside. Graham makes me feel special. Just hearing his voice makes me feel like I'm the most important boy on earth. I push myself up upon my bed. I didn't think you were coming, I say. Graham leans the tripod against the wall. Wouldn't miss it. It's not every day we get the chance to catch a real-life superhero on film. He walks over to me and rubs my head like he's my best friend. He's not my best friend, but he is the person that I've known the longest. Last year, he thought it would be the last time he would be able to do the program. The BBC told him that they were going to cut his money and they were only going to allow him an hour instead of the whole series. But when four million people watched me on their TVs, they decided to let Graham's film again. Graham tell me that, told me that I'm famous that there isn't a day that goes by that someone doesn't ask him how I am. I don't feel famous, though. After each episode goes out, Graham forwards emails from people who watched it, but they only last for a few weeks. Graham sits on the edge of the bed. So, how are you doing, Joe? My head begins to throb. I tilt my eyes down and hope that it will clear. Graham gently squeezes my shoulder. Hey, he says, where's the li lively lad I met last year, eh? Refueling his jets and webs. I point at my Spider-Man t-shirt. Graham laughs. And maybe getting a bigger suit, he says. You've grown. Not as big as the Incredible Hulk. No, not that big yet. My head starts to spin. I close my eyes. Charlotte R. stands up and walks to my side. You shouldn't be doing this if you're, feel if you're not feeling right. No, I want to. I'm just a bit tired. 
You're like my kids when they were your age, Graham says. Too tired to get up in the mornings. Even when they did, they spent all day in their pajamas on their phones. I grin. I do that all the time. Graham laughs. Yes, I bet you do. You're all the same. Look, he says to Charlotte R., I think Joe is old enough to make up his own mind. Charlotte R. bites her lip. I don't want to get her into trouble. She's nice. I'll tell you if I feel bad. I've been looking forward to this for ages. I can't stop just because I'm tired. Do you promise you'll say yes? Charlotte nods at me, then at Graham. Okay, she says. Let's see how it goes. She walks back to her chair. Graham grins at me. Good lad. He rubs my head again, and I don't know if it's because he he's happy or because we're getting ready to film, but suddenly I feel better. Graham sees me look at the camera guy. Ah, introductions. New cameraman. David, this is Joe. Joe, this is David. New cameraman David takes his eye away from the viewfinder and waves. I wave back. New cameraman David looks through, back through the lens and pans around the room. See, they've given you a sofa, Joe, Graham says, and a new TV. I'm getting Sky TV, too. What? We can't have you watching the competition. Graham's face goes straight, then cracks into a smile again. He looks different than the last time I saw him. He's still as friendly as I remember, but his hair is much grayer than last year, and his face is brown like he's just come back from vacation. He makes me feel like my white face is practically see-through. He looks at me for a long time like he's waiting for me to talk, but I can't think of anything to say. Graham nods at Theo, my Theo Walcott poster. So you won a trophy at last? Yes, but he didn't play. He was just injured. He's always injured. I want to say more, but I can't. I only get to meet Graham once a year, so it's like I have to get to know him all over again. Tell you what, why don't we just watch the DVD to remind us of where we are? He gets up, takes a DVD out of a silver box, and puts it in the player. New cameraman David moves toward the window. Here we go. Graham hands me the remote and sits beside me. I press play. The Bubble Boy. Highlights. We watch a montage of my life. Me wearing a Spider-Man suit and sitting with Mom and Dad on my birthday. Mom and Dad talking to Graham. Mom smiling. Dad looking worried. Me pretending to ride an ATV around my bed. Me sitting in my bed with a bald head from chemo when I had the bone marrow transplant. Beth crying. Me crying. Me and Beth hugging each other after the transplant didn't work. A picture of Mom and Dad on the front of the newspaper. Doctors looking at my charts. Graham talking to the doctors. Then the camera zooms in on Graham asking me the same question every year. What's it like to live in a bubble? It's great. I don't really notice. What's it like to live in a bubble? It's okay. I get to be on TV. What's it like to live in a bubble? It's horrible. I want to escape. More images flash in front of me, but I feel my heart rate pick up. I glance at the monitor, and that makes it pick up even more. Graham smiling. Graham still smiling. Graham talking to the camera. And that's the extraordinary story of an extraordinary boy, a real-life superhero. Graham presses the ejection button. David is pointing the camera right at me. The lens whirls around the as it zooms in. I look at the ground, then out at the window. I'm supposed to speak now, but my throat closes up from the pressure, and I don't know what to say. What can I say when my life highlights only last 10 minutes? For other kids in the hospital, it takes ages. Their parents film them riding around the park, playing on swings, sliding on zip lines, jumping on trampolines. That's probably just one day. They've got loads to talk about. All I've got got is what happens in this room and in my dreams and no mom and dad to make the videos when I look up at Graham gives me a smile that I think means it's okay it must be difficult he says don't think I'm overstanding here thinking it's easy Graham clears his throat so he says let's talk about what happened in the last year I shrug not much we'll pack up then shall we David new cameraman David grins behind the camera and then it goes quiet again tell you what I'll tell you what I've been doing, and we'll see if we can go from there, okay? I nod. I know the program is supposed to be about me, but I like to hear what's happening in Graham's life. Every year he learns more about me, and I learn more about him. Had Libby gone to university the last time I saw you? No. She was taking her A-levels. Graham smiles, of course. Well, she's at extra now. I lean back on my pillow, and Graham tells me about what his family's been up to. He has a wife and two children. They live in a three-story house in Manchester, but they've been thinking of moving because their children have grown up, and they don't have any space to park their, their cars. He's got a daughter called Libby, who's really good at English, and a son called George, who's studying biology at university. He shows me pictures of them all. I tell him they've grown, and that his wife looks pretty, and he says he'd tell her. Then he shows me a picture of them all walking their dog on the beach. I take it and hold it really close to my face, like I'm there too. Graham is standing there with his arms around his wife and Libby's shoulders. George has got his arm ready to throw a ball, and the dog is getting ready to chase. Do you still think about going to the beach a lot? asks Graham. 
I nod. Yes, when I see pictures like this, or ads for vacation on TV, I'd like to jump over the waves. Or surf, even. Yes, I'd like to surf. But I don't even know if I could swim. I look at the picture again. Graham's family, the other children playing behind them, the shiny sand, the waves frozen in time. New cameraman David leans against the well, the wall by the monitors and points the camera over to Graham's shoulder. Graham leans close, closer to me. Tell me what you're thinking, Joe. My stomach goes tight. Graham glanced at the monitor. 95. My heart rate has increased five beats. Don't worry. It just does that. Greg says it goes nuts when I dream. Graham chuckles, glances at the camera in the back at me. So what are you thinking? I was thinking about what it's like to walk on sand. Graham puffs out his cheeks. Wow, he says. That's a hard one. It's hard to describe. Sometimes it's as hard as this floor and your feet stay firm. Sometimes it's soft and your feet sink in. But what does it feel like? Graham turns his head. His eyes search the room. I don't know, Joe. Maybe it feels like walking on your bed, but with water filling my footprints. Yeah, something like that. I look back at the picture. I like talking about your family, I say. Why? I like seeing wh where you've been. Even though you can't go there? Yes, I'm not the only one who hasn't been to the beach. Henry hasn't either, but lots of kids that don't live in bubbles don't get to see the world either. True. True. How is Henry? He's okay. We're hoping he might get to see each other soon. NASA has made him a spacesuit so he can go outside. That's great. Not really. He only went to the end of the corridor, but he thinks he might go further tomorrow, and then next month he'll be going to the mall. Graham smiles. Brilliant, he says. Tell him good luck for me. What about you? I can't get a suit. I wrote to the Prime Minister to see if he could get me one. What did he say? He sent me a letter. He said he'd see me on TV. He couldn't promise me anything, but he'd like to talk some, to some scientists. Great. I know, but that was three months ago. I reach over and get the letter from my drawer. Graham reads it and shows it to the cameraman. I sent one to the European Space Agency, too, but they haven't replied. Henry told me to write to Stark Industries. It's where all the Avengers work. Starks has lots, uh, loads of money, more than the NHS, more than NASA. Yes, they probably have. Graham hands me back the letter. But what would you do if you could go outside the hospital? Even if they had the money, I don't think the doctors would let me go outside. But if they did... I'd go and live with Beth. And where does she live? Islington. But she's got to go away soon. It's her residency. Where is she going? I don't know. But I hope it's not far. Graham waits for me to say something else, but my throat is aching, and I can feel my eyes watering. I look down at my bed. Graham taps his hand on my leg. Joe, would you rather talk about something else? I swallow, shake my head, and stop the tears from coming out. No, it's okay. I know she has to go. She wants to be a doctor. I want her to be one, too. She'll be great, says Graham. And what about you? What would you like to do for work? I look down at my hands. He always asks me that, but he knows that the kids with SCID die before they're old enough to get a job, if they don't get fixed. Graham leans forward. Joe, you always ask me that. I know. It's just that this year, the answer might be different. People change their minds as they get older. I won't. Still want to be a superhero? I am a superhero. That's what everyone says. New cameraman David makes a circle with his index finger and thumb, and the red light goes out. That's brilliant, Joe. Have we finished already? No, but you need to take a break, Charlotte R. says as she walks over. But I'm okay. David sets the camera up on the tripod. It's all right, says Graham. We'll go to lunch and leave the camera running. You know what to do. Just forget it's there, like it's a fly on the wall. There's never been a fly in here, I say. There's never even been an ant. Ha, huh, it's funny, he says. But I haven't thought of that. But I saw a wasp once. Did you? Over here. I walk over to the window. It was down there in the other side of the window. I point to the corner where the frame meets the wall. It flew around all day. I couldn't hear it, but I could feel the buzz through the glass with my fingers. It just kept buzzing around like it was looking for a hole. I thought it would get in. I saw it on TV. Wasps, wasps can eat their way through stone and concrete. Greg told me not to worry, but I did. I dreamt the room was full of wasps that they were buzzing all around me, that they were in my hair, in my ears, in my nose, in my mouth, and they were flying into the air conditioner, blocking the vents, jamming the blades, that they were everywhere in the plug sockets and the machines, I thought. Charlotte R. puts her hand on my shoulder. Hey, Joe, it's okay. They're not in here now. I step away from the window. My heart is thudding and my arms are sweating. It was scary when the wasp was nearly came, came in. Charlotte guides me back to my bed. Graham stands beside me. Take it easy, Joe. Just relax. We'll be back soon. He walks towards the door with new cameraman David. Charlotte rubs my arm. You just stay still and I'll check in that Dr. Moore is on his way. I nod and they leave me alone with the fly on the wall. I'm not sure what to do. I can't just sit still. 
People will want me to do something. It'll be boring if all they do is see me laying on my bed. They'll look at my laptop, my TV, but it isn't actually doing anything. It's me just staying still looking at screens. But what else can I do? I don't do anything else all day. Once the doctors gave me an exercise bike with a DVD, but I had to watch it at the same time. They said it would be good for my blood supply and it would help my heart and my lungs. I pedaled for an hour. The wheel spun around, but I didn't move an inch, and it felt like I was a hamster in a ball. I didn't do it again. It's boring watching a simulator on a DVD when everybody else gets to cycle by fields. The running machine was worse. They put electrodes on my chest and wired me to monitors. I only ran for two minutes. My heart rate went up to 142, and then it stopped. The doctors thought it was because I was tired, but it was because I was so scared to see my heart rate so high. I looked around the room. The red light is still flashing on the camera. I lie back and go to sleep. I have a dream, but I don't remember what it is. The only thing that it had wasps in it. Rain is running down the window when I wake up. Graham and the new cameraman, David, are whispering in the corner. They both turn and look when I sit up. Sorry, I say. Don't think I was... Don't think it was anything interesting. Don't worry about it, Graham says. You were brilliant. How are you feeling? Charlotte told me that Dr. Moore came by and said you were doing fine. I'm okay, but still tired. Dr. Moore said it's best that we shoot in about a half hour slot so you can rest in between. I nod. Okay. New cameraman David stands in the middle of the room and holds up the gadgets and checks the lights. Then he goes back to his camera and takes it off the tripod. I sit with Graham on the sofa. I like talking with him, but when the time goes past three o'clock, all I can think about is how empty the room will be when he and the new cameraman, David, leave. I want to say something that will make them feel like they want to stay longer. I wish they could come more often, but I don't think I do anything interesting enough to be on TV more than I already am. At four o'clock, Amir comes in. He checks that I am okay, checks the monitors, looks out the window, hands me a cup, and gives me pills. Graham asks him how long he's worked with me, but Amir doesn't hear him. He can be so funny and noisy when he wants to be, but so quiet when he meets new people. He's nervous, and some people don't like that. You have to wait a while for him to turn into a friend. Amir goes into the bathroom, then turns the waves and waves his hands behind Graham to get my attention, but I don't understand what he wants. He opens his mouth wide and points to the sky like he's playing charades. Have you seen any? I shrug and try to mouth back. Planes? Amir shakes his head. No. Aliens. Graham turns around. Amir scratches his head. Are you okay, says Graham. Amir nods. I'm good. You good? I'm fine, says Graham. I can tell he thinks Amir is a total loony. Then we are all good, aren't we, Joe? Amir winks at me and I grin back, trying to concentrate on not laughing, in case Graham thinks I'm laughing at him. Right, says Graham. Where were we? Amir points to the window. Keep watching, he mouths dramatically. I'm still smiling as he walks to the door. Graham glances up at me. He's weird? Yes. He is, but he's brilliant at countdown. Graham laughs. Perfect, Joe, he says. We're going to wrap it up there. Already? Afraid so, new cameraman. David takes the tripod down and puts the camera in the silver case and holds it out in his hand. It's been so nice to meet you, Joe. You too. I shake his hand and then follow him and Graham toward the door. When will I be on TV, I ask. Next Monday, he says. Oh, and don't forget to answer your fan mail. I never do. I answer every one of them. It's the fans that go away. Graham looks at me like he always wants to hug me. I get this look a lot. Don't worry, he says. Maybe you'll get some good friends this time. Hope so. Then he does hug me. Not too tight, but just enough for me to feel his hands in the middle of my back. Then he's gone. Sometimes he leaves me with a present. He bought me a microphone once. Another time he brought me a copy of the script from Doctor Who, signed by David Tennant. He didn't leave me anything this time. I think maybe he forgot. That when he gets to his car, he'll find something in his pocket and he'll run back and leave it in the reception. I wish I saw him more often, or at least got a text from him once a week or maybe a month, but he doesn't send me texts. He just goes out the door and I don't hear from him again for another year. And that's the end of chapter 6.